I believe that the number one motivator for a human being is the avoidance of discomfort. You wake up in the morning uh, with the greatest intentions to exercise or work on that book you're writing. And before you know it, you're instead making coffee and reading the news and checking Instagram. That's your brain avoiding the uncomfortable work. You've got to recognize the resistance you're going to face consciously and subconsciously. And then you got to commit to just bite-sized action. And it's got to be consistent. And you broadcast to everybody that this is who you are and this is your new plan. And you say it over and over and over. You have a chance. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the podcast and welcome to 2022. To usher in the new year correct, today I'm joined by my buddy, Joe DeSena. Joe's the founder and CEO of Spartan Race, and he's returning to the show for a bit of a boot in the rear to shake the cobwebs loose and jumpstart those resolutions. Joe last graced the studio a little over a year ago in December of 2020. And that episode, which went deep into his absolutely fascinating backstory, was a hit. So please check it out if you missed it. And so in the spirited annual tradition that we have here to launch the new year with the mindset tools and the motivation that you need to embrace your new year ambitions properly, I thought it fit quite literally to have Joe drop by for a more focused discourse on just that. Joe's got a new book out, it's called 10 Rules for Resilience. And it's essentially a guide for you as well as for your young ones and your families to develop what he calls true resilience. What is true resilience? Well, we talk about that. We also talk about how and why cultivating resilience, as well as its siblings, things like discipline and courage, can and should be built into parenting. We also discuss the importance of personal values in adhering to your goals, how to navigate failure, super important topic, and many other subjects. Joe is a character. He's a force of nature, certainly a talented motivator, that's for sure. Maybe even a bit of a lunatic, but I love him. So hit that subscribe button and let's welcome 2022 with the singular Mr. Joe DeSena. Well, good to see you, man. I think uh, it's been a little over a year since I saw you last. Lots of Lots has happened. We got a lot of stuff to talk about. Yeah, on the way in the pandemic, right? And, and the way out. Yeah. Um, I come through uh, LA. Thanks for having me. I love yeah. the new. Sp I love the new space. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, and you've been all over the place, weren't you? Just you were just in Abu Dhabi, right, for the World Championships. I don't know if I told you this, but um, and I don't remember exactly when I was here last. But I never stopped traveling, even with all the bans and everything that we were told not to go anywhere. I went everywhere, uh -huh. and um, I don't know if people listening will say, "Oh, that guy's so irresponsible." But like, it was awesome because, and I'm so pissed that I didn't film it because airports were completely empty, like Arbogaden. I was at, in Rome at the Coliseum. I was the only person, the only person there. It was unbelievable wow. traveling around the world. And um, I just capped it off with a trip to Abu Dhabi. We're right in the middle of what they call the empty quarter, which is this massive desert, the, the kind that you would envision if you and I were in Lawrence of Arabia, right? That mm -hmm. old movie camels, falcons, like in the middle of nowhere. And we uh, we put on a race. It was unbelievable. Yeah. I was out in the desert. I took my shoes off because I couldn't walk on my shoes. And it was like, I, I had to pinch myself. I can't believe I'm out in the middle of the desert. Like remember in the cartoons where mm -hmm. you'd say, gee, I wonder if I could make it without water. Is that an oasis? Am I, am I just, you know, is my mind tricking me? And is that really water? It was like that. Wow. It was unbelievable. And symbolically, just, you know, the message is Spartan is back. I mean, it's been rough for you guys having all your races canceled, 500 if, employees, having to weather all of that. If you, uh, you couldn't make it up. I mean, we were on top of the world. We bought out our, uh, bought out our competitor right before the pandemic. Uh, finally, after 15 years of hell, profitable, had some cash in the bank. And then this hit and um, I had a shutdown of 45 countries had a furlough 400 people. Um, and I'm still feeling the pain. I'm reeling mm -hmm. from the pain still um, today. There's nothing, the government's done a lot for us, but um, they can't do enough. Yeah, I mean, I'm just looking at it thinking, how did you even keep it together without going bankrupt? It's pretty hard. Um, 
It's, it's, it's been, it's been, I almost broke down and started crying <laughs> yeah. here for a second. It's but been, it's like all everything, you know, I mean, we're here, the occasion for the podcast is this, is this new book that you wrote, 10 Rules for Resilience. Like your lifetime of building up this reservoir of resilience and, you know, all of these tools that are uh, lifted from your many experiences and adventures are now being called in, you know, you're being tested at the, at the ultimate level. I was pressure tested for sure. The team was pressure tested. We lost some good people just because I'm sure people are like, oh, these guys are gonna make it or not make it. Um, and I've probably been, there's probably been five moments in the last 18 months where it was like touch and go. It was like a couple more days, we're gonna have to just pull the ripcord. And then miraculously, there's a PPP loan or there's another government loan or you're gonna love this. I became friends, he's gonna kill me for telling you. I became friends with the owner of Saks Fifth Avenue. Uh -huh. And the reason I became friends uh, with him is we randomly met through a, a third party as you meet most friends. And we were in uh, Colorado skiing and he goes, I wake up really, I go, I wake up really early, right? I'm sure you wake up really yeah. early. I work out, what do you do? Or whatever, he gets business done. <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> like, like your gaydar for the other guy that it, like lives your lifestyle. Yeah, and so I go, um, I go, you know, I got this rusty chain, this 83 pound chain that I usually drag around in the mornings, which I brought with me to Colorado. I go, um, I'll swing by your house early in the morning. I'll drag the chain over. It looks like on, on the map, you looks like you're only a half mile away. Mm -hmm. Turned out he was five miles away, right? I dragged this frigging chain because I wanted to be on time. I'm hustling and we became good buddies. Well, believe it or not, Saks Fifth Avenue has done incredibly well through the pandemic. Lots of people that have been getting government checks, which should not be shopping at Saks, have been using those checks to go buy things they shouldn't be. And then he spun off the, the dot com. There's a lot of mm -hmm. good things happening to him. And one day, my wife's like, "You got to, you know, have you read the FedEx on the on the kitchen table?" And this is when it was touch, really touch and go with our business. And I'm like, "No, I'm like, oh great, now the IRS is suing us, or mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, who knows what I'm dealing with now." And I open it up. And I'm like, oh, a customer sent me a, a, a $10 check or something to say, you know, we support you. It was a million dollar check from him. Wow. And it was like, and it was a little handwritten note. And he said, um, he said, hey, I just had a really good week. I just want you to know, I love what you're doing. Use it, don't use it, stick it in a drawer for a rainy day. I hope I didn't embarrass you. And so I've had a bunch of friends uh, and the government and the customers and vendors who, this is this will blow you away because you're a lawyer, Wilkie Farr, mm -hmm. right? Big, am I saying it correctly? Yeah, big law firm, Wilkie Farr and Gallagher. I don't yeah. know what it's called yeah, now. Yeah. Maybe it's big, just Wilkie Farr. Giant yeah. law firm. They helped us get the Tough Mudder deal done, and it was a big. I, we have a bill with them, and I called them like all the other vendors, and they were like, "Pay us whatever you want, whenever you want. We're mm -hmm. behind you." That's very um, how law often, firm like. <laughs> how, how often does <laughs> yeah. that happen? Yeah, it's like this is unbelievable. Wow. Well, it has to be a testament to the goodwill that you've sown over many years. You know, it's like if you're if you're someone of character who's conducting themselves in a certain kind of aspirational way, and you've treated people well throughout the course of your life, like karmically, it's not surprising. No, you know, me knowing the kind of person that you are, but also very affirming of the goodness of humanity that, that, that people would do that. It, it makes you feel good. And um, look, I can't say I've done everything perfectly in my life. You can't, right? We, mm. We've made lots of mistakes, but, um, but I do the best I can. And, um, and, and again, when we talk about the book and kids, like, I guess you gotta be humble, right? You gotta have, you come with your hands down, not with your hands out, don't, right? Don't always be asking and, and uh, the universe somehow has kept us from failing. And now races are coming back mm -hmm. just in time for the Omnicron. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're in another wave. So we'll see what happens. See it what feels happens. like everything is very tentative right now yeah. across the board. Um, so much to get into with you, but before we go any further, there's this exercise bike here that you know, I cut like a couple of weeks ago, there was an email. I can't remember if it was from somebody on your team. Like, oh, Joe wants to send you this bike. Uh, look out for an email. And then there was another email, like, oh, we're, 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 we're gonna install the bike on this day. And a bunch of guys came in and installed this, this 
stationary bike machine here. And I was like, I don't know what this is about. Is this Joe's bike? Does he want to, does he want to ride it during the podcast? Like, there was no like background on what's happening here, but there is a bike over here. Like you care to explain? I, well, first off, is- I make a lot of mistakes. And, and one of the, the big mistakes I make is um, I'm really quick with email and I'll just send an email and there's no context and you can't figure out what's going on. I, po- I apologize for that. But what happened was um, again, it ties into this book. This guy I got to know, Gordon Kaplan, uh, was tied up in that whole Varsity Blues uh, scandal. Mm. He was a big lawyer. College tuition thing. Yep, he was a big lawyer, chairman of a law firm, uh, uh, attempted to get his daughter into a school, uh, got caught and and lost his license and got kicked out of his law firm and basically hit the depths of despair. being from the, na- the neighborhood I'm from, where I know lots of people that went to jail and got out uh, and survived, I uh, befriended him and I said, I could help you out. I'll introduce you to some guys. I'll let you know what you're in for. And uh, he came out and he was very appreciative that you know when a lot of people wanted to distance themselves from him, I was actually saying, no, wait, mm-hmm. you're, we're, I'm your friend. Like, don't worry, whatever you need. It wasn't like he killed somebody. Yeah. Uh, he made a mistake, like many parents uh, make. You could easily see, by the way, you could easily see how it how you, it's a slippery slope. Like, oh, I want to help my kid out. I want to get him in a good college, and before maybe you, you don't know, go. Th- before maybe you, you know it, be, right? <laughs> you're, you're you know making up stories about uh, him scores. or her being on the sailing team, and you know all kinds of stuff. Yeah, yeah test scores. So he I comes. Mean, that out. whole thing was unbelievable. Unbelievable, unbelievable. And well, let's get into that. But he comes out. And he got involved with this bike company called Carol. And um, I said, look, Gordon, I'm not into, like I'm the last guy to send a bike to that's supposed to get you in shape with 10 minutes a day. Like, like if you told me it's a bike that you carry, um, it would make sense, <laughs> <laughs> right? You don't even ride it, you carry uh-huh. it up a mountain. And, and, um, and they sent it to me and I wrote it. And I, for anybody listening, I'm, like, I'm, I don't wanna sound like a commercial because it's just a bike. But, um, but it's pretty cool. Mm. And, and it's a good way for me to warm up before I do my big workout. And if they were guiding you and I and how to advertise for it, I would not be the guy to say that because their pitch is you get in a great workout in 10 minutes. My pitch on it would be that 10 minutes is my warm up, and then I mm-hmm. go do other stuff. Right. Um, but they've been bugging me that like, we wanna get to Rich Roll or whatever. And I was like, well, I know him, but I'm busy. And I just kept putting it off and then I was like, oh, I'm going to see Rich Roll. Why don't you send them a bike? And when I get there, I'll show it to them. But then I forgot about it. I did not expect to see it. And then you walked in, it was here. It was and here. We're, we're, <laughs> I was like, please explain why there's a bike here. <laughs> yeah, because there wasn't a lot of, uh, you know, kind of background or explanation, right? But I appreciate it. It's cool. I haven't given it a spin yet, but. Give it a spin, see if you like it. And um, if you don't, um, carry it around the neighborhood. Yeah. Well, the whole subject of parents getting caught up in the greater welfare of their children and then sliding down a slippery slope of making some you know, ethically dubious decisions that get them in trouble is sort of apropos to the themes of the book, The 10 Rules for Resilience, which is really all about, um, I mean, you've characterized it as a parenting book and I wanna hear the back story behind that, but it's sort of a Trojan horse in terms of being a parenting book because as you know, you can't, teach your children any of the principles that you articulate in the book if you're not living them them yourself, right? So each chapter, you have these 10 principles and each chapter is really about like how to cultivate this in your own way, followed by sections around, okay, here's how you now transition that into how you parent or imbue your family with, you know, these these ideas. Yeah, and the the thinking is um, kids watch you you know, forget about listening. Um, they're watching and, and you're modeling whether you know it or not. And so you have to live the life you expect them to live. My father worked really hard. My mother worked hard around health and wellness. And um, you're just picking it up through osmosis, right? And so uh, don't expect if you're disappointed in your child um, uh, and they're not honest or whatever the things are, well, it's you have a reflection to look in on, the mirror. Yeah, yeah, you gotta look in the mirror. It's a reflection on you. The book, came about because um, when we had children, my wife and I, had ch- we have four kids. Um, we started skiing in Vermont. That was our first sport. And I remember my two little boys skiing with me and we sat down for lunch and I 
sought out the healthiest meal I could in a ski resort. And we sat down and we're going to get right back out there. And the guy next to us put like two cookies on my tray and said, hey, give it to the kids. And I was like, can I curse here? Yeah. Why the fuck are you putting two cookies? <laughs> like, you know how hard it is for me to keep cookies away, away from these from kids? Them. And you just did that. And then it happened in a bank where I was trying to teach them how to deposit $10 and how deposits work and how banks work. The teller was giving them lollipops. And, and then in, in, in challenging them to go, run around the neighborhood or one day we were carrying kettlebells for a mile, parents, people would stop. And I remember this one instance where a lady stopped, she screeched her car and she said uh, to the kids, not to me, directed right at the kids, are you okay? I saw you carrying these kettle, you know, these heavy weights mm -hmm. for the last half. Is he, is he harming you? What are you right. talking about? She's going to call child services. We, I mean, that's what it came to. And, and, um, and then I thought, hang on a second. It's really not her fault. She hasn't seen a child on a sidewalk in like a decade, right? She certainly hasn't mm. seen one carrying a kettlebell around the neighborhood, right? They might as well have been wild animals. So, so I started messing around with this idea. We need a book that like breaks some eggs and is a little bold and is gonna piss people off, but um, is a little more hardcore um, parenting. And it's not, you know, use all the, the terms we hear like, we're not snow blowing, right? We're not helicopter parenting. Mm -hmm. We're like, we're flamethrower parents. <laughs> like I'm putting <laughs> obstacles in their way. Uh huh. Yeah, and you've really, uh, you've really done that. And it's impossible to read the book without reflecting. You know, I have four kids too, and yeah. thinking, yeah, I didn't do that so well. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, I, I think on some level we parent either to. Um, you know, honor the traditions of our parents. And it seems like you've you've taken the best of how you were parented and, and tried to, you know, imbue your parenting with that. Or we try to parent in opposition to the way we were parented because we were traumatized or we feel like, you know, we were led down some dark alleys or whatever. And I just know in my own case, my parents were great and um, they provided for me and they weren't overly rough, but there was high expectations set. Um, and I strived very hard to meet those expectations, but I always felt like I couldn't quite get there. And I think consciously or unconsciously, when I had kids, I thought, I don't want to do that to them. You know, and so I've probably been on the spectrum of things softer than my parents were, um, for better or worse. And, you know, my kids aren't athletes, they're all artists. And luckily they've all pretty much found things that excite them. And so we challenge them in, in that regard and push them and hold them accountable. Um, but they're all pursuing things that they enjoy, but, I, but I'm not the kettlebell guy or the guy who's getting them up at five in the morning and making them you know, take cold showers and stuff like that. And, and I've seen what you just described. I, I remember the neighborhood I grew up in was all organized crime and the next generation, I always scratched my head as a kid and said, why is the next generation softer when their dad does that for mm -hmm. a living? And it was because the parents had tough upbringings and they wanted to make it easier sure. for the kid. That's the dilemma of like every successful person who pulled themselves up and, and you know built a big life for themselves. And then they have kids. And, and suddenly they're living in a huge house. Like Kevin Hart talks about this, you know, all the time. Like my kids are, you know, I can't, I can't get them to do anything. They're hopeless, you know. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I, um, I got a little sense of that, and I, I always reflect back on the movie Rocky. Um, I don't know if it was Rocky Three where he had the kids and he had the money, and all of a sudden he became complacent, mm -hmm. and um, and so that really stuck in my brain, especially with the backdrop of the neighborhood kids being softer, a lot softer than the hardcore parents. And I said, um, and my wife went along with it. Um, let's make, let's try to make the kids tougher because life's tough. Like when my kids complain to me, um, like they, like all kids do uh, the other day, whatever, Charlie was saying something about like, oh, my arm hurts or whatever, your arm hurts. I got to make payroll this week. Mm -hmm. like, you know what I mean? Like, like suck it up. And my wife will say like, oh, you're too hard on them. Too hard on them. Uh -huh. Like, I just lost my best employee. Like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like, so I don't know. I, I feel like we're raising adults and wouldn't we want them to practice with us 
on how hard that's going to be rather than when we're not around. Yeah. You know, and and if I fail anywhere as I listen to you, I push the uh, workout stuff too much. Mm-hmm. Um, they should be working in a hardware store a couple of days a week. They should be uh, doing some other, you know, learning some other things, doing some artwork, like you said. I'm constantly drilling uh, the exercise and uh, to the point where I'm afraid someday they'll be like, oh, thank God he's gone. We don't have to exercise <laughs> every day. Yeah. yeah, take a break, <laughs> right? Exactly. But wait, how old are they now? They're like I've 16 got, and down? Yeah, six, 16, 14, 12, eight. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. So my my older two are a little bit older, but then we have eighteen and fourteen. So you know, in the zone. In the zone. Yeah, yeah. And um, and they're seeing the 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 benefits of the, of the hard work. You know, they go out and do a physical fitness test at school, and they perform really well. And hopefully, they make that connection. Uh, okay, that's because dad was driving us nuts. Mm-hmm. Um, and you got to have you got to have a sp- you got to have a partner that goes along with it. My if my wife didn't go along, it would be really a disaster. Right. But she didn't think you writing this book was such a good idea. She did not want me to write the book. <laughs> we actually we actually fought over it because, um, you know, there's there's a history in America of folks writing uh, parenting books and being completely wrong. Like, what the hell do we know? We're all just trying to figure it out. Mm-hmm. And um, and then we have we have a, I'm friendly with a psychologist who was willing to uh, put her name on the cover as well, and that gave me enough credibility that my wife said, "All right." You can go, you know, if there's a yeah. psychologist involved, then maybe- You go not. fishing for the one- <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Who would, who would approve of your methods. Yeah. I, well, that's what I did. We dark call, arts. We, we called 983 psychologists. <laughs> and then finally, <laughs> Dr. L answered the phone and was like, all right, well, I need some extra money. I'll do it. Uh-huh. There you go. <laughs> um, well, we have uh, a bit of an annual tradition here on, on the show where we try to- uh, kick people off into the new year with their heads straight. We've had a bunch of Navy SEALs, et cetera that serve that purpose. Um, and I just thought like you, you're sort of the perfect person to do this this year, you know, this moment when we find ourselves plotting our, our goals and our ambitions for, for what's to come, you know, pledging that this year is gonna be different, that you're not gonna give up this time. Um, but at the same time, I think it's important to kind of recognize or, or, or reconcile with the fact that like this year is kind of different because we're coming out of two years of this pandemic. And we've all had our ebbs and flows and setbacks professionally and personally. We've had those battles with, you know, our our mindset and our habits and our discipline and our schedules and our, you know, ability to kind of, you know, deal with the Zoom culture that we're in right now. But I, I sense that a lot of people have kind of played that out. Like they're like, okay, I did the Netflix thing. And I, you know, walked around my house in my pajamas for seven days straight without taking a shower. I know what that reaps and I'm not happy and I'm depressed. And, you know, with that, I think some people feel stuck, but also fed up enough. And the symbolic nature of like January 1st is kind of like, okay, how am I gonna move forward? How am I gonna shift this? I don't wanna continue to live this way. The proverbial, New Year's resolution. Yeah, I know. Right. Which is, you know, problematic in many ways, but also, you know, at least it creates a conversation around the idea of personal change and, and, and the, and I think, you know, we're both big believers in the fact that people can transform and we see it all the time. And our work shares that sensibility of trying to help people understand that we all have it within ourselves to, change those things that we don't like about ourselves. Yeah, just because you've been one way for half your life um, doesn't mean you have to be that way for the rest of your life. Just because you have a thought in your mind doesn't mean it's true, right? And so you need to start changing that narrative. I am, I'm obviously a big, I mean, this is all I preach is, is, and it doesn't matter if it's January 1st or July 2nd, or it doesn't matter, just start. Um, So here's what I believe. Um, I believe that the number one motivator for a human being is the avoidance of discomfort. And it's not just me. I've done a lot of podcasts too. I talked to some smart people like yourself and um, we will avoid discomfort at all costs. It kept us from freezing uh, for thousands of years on the planet or falling off cliffs. And we don't even know we're doing it. You wake up in the morning uh, with the greatest intentions to exercise or work on that book you're writing. And before you know it, you're instead making coffee and reading the news and checking Instagram. That's your brain avoiding the uncomfortable work. Mm -hmm. And so the quicker you could recognize that that 
it's me. I, I didn't get my 300 burpees done this morning. I got 180. I'm, I've somehow found 22 phone calls to make that, that I could have lived without because I just didn't want to get the 300 done, right. right? And so you've got to recognize that that's what's driving you consciously and subconsciously. And then you got to commit to just bite-sized action. And it's got to be consistent. A lot of people, I'm going to go in the gym. I'm going to do all these things. And then, you know, life does get in the way and you don't get that three-hour workout or whatever that thing is you committed to. And then all of a sudden you fall off completely and you don't mm -hmm. do it. But if you commit to, I'm just going to walk a mile a day or I'm just going to take stairs instead, whatever the thing is, I'm, gonna have, I'm just going to have a salad with every meal. I'm still going to eat cake. I'm still going to eat meat, whatever. But I'm going to have a salad. With, like if it's bite size and you broadcast to everybody that this is who you are and this is your new plan and you say it over and over and over and you recognize the resistance you're going to face consciously and subconsciously, you have a chance. And then the last thing I would add is you got to have a date on the calendar. You got to have something pending mm -hmm. that's coming up, right? That's a little scary. It's a little scary, but you got to have a date on the calendar. We, we have a wedding business in Vermont, my wife and I, and uh, we've been doing it for 22 years. And I get to meet the couples a year before they get married. Mm -hmm. And they're one size and shape when they show up to book the place. And they're a different size and shape when they show up to get married. <laughs> and, and so they have a date yeah. on the calendar, yeah. right? And I started toying with it. Oh, wait a minute. When I have these races on my own personal calendar, I wake up earlier. I go to bed earlier. I don't mm -hmm. eat as many cookies. So, so you gotta have, it just very few of us do it without a date on the calendar. Right. So it's this tension between the date on the calendar, which is the big scary thing, and the daily bite-sized things that are very digestible. And I think people lose enthusiasm around the bite-sized thing because it's not sexy. Um, but that truly is the way that you move everything, right? It's just adherence to that small thing that you can do every single day. And when you do it, even after a few times, you become much more emotionally engaged and connected to that thing because you built, there's something ephemeral, but also powerful about momentum that doesn't make sense. But once you've created a little bit of momentum, a lot of that resistance starts to fade. Yeah, the momentum, um, the fact that uh, it's a ritual that you get to break, a streak that you get, you know, hey, 60 days in a row mm -hmm. I've walked. And I have lots of people telling me they've done it. And so, um, yeah, you just have to start. You just have to start. And, and um, consistency is more important than um, I would say quality, mm -hmm. really, yeah, or quantity. 100%. It's just consistency. Why do you think most people, the vast majority of people fall off their New Year's resolutions? Well, I think they, they bite off more than they can chew. They make, a, they, I'm gonna go to the gym every single day and work out for an mm -hmm. hour and a half, or I'm gonna, uh, whatever the thing is, it's just too big. Right, and, and, and it's too big of a change from where they were. So um, look, I've talked to lots of Olympians as, I, as I'm sure you have, and lots of successful businessmen. And, and there's one thing in common that I find, and it's something I employ, which is, um, I don't feel like doing this, right? I know I said I walk, I just don't feel like doing it. I don't feel like doing my 300 burpees. I'll tell you what, Joe, we're just gonna do 10 today. We can live with 10. Mm -hmm. And then you do 10, you're like, I got 20 done. Yeah. Right. Uh, Twenty, I can get thirty done. I'm embarrassed. I don't get forty done. And and uh, cyclists that have five hours to ride every single day tell me they're just going to do thirty minutes because they don't feel like doing it now. I was with two world champion rowers in Abu Dhabi uh, two weeks ago. Same thing. They got to go out there mm. seven hours a day. All right. Today we're just doing an hour. Right. An hour turns into two and turns it right. So like that first bit is always the hardest part. Just get going Getting out the door. And 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 so don't bite off too much. Um, tell yourself, lie to yourself and say, we're just going to do a little bit today because a little bit's better than nothing. And, um, and stop with the BS of, uh, I don't have the time. Are you kidding me? Just track how much time you spend doing nothing. We all do so much nothing, right? Well, we also delude ourselves around that too. We think we don't have time and we think we're busy and we're productive throughout the day. But I've engaged in this exercise where if you have a practice, uh, get you know, like carry a journal around with you and write down what you're doing every 15 minutes, yeah. it will blow your mind. It blows your mind. 
yeah. at how much time you just waste doing things that don't move the needle, right? So, so it's not a time thing; it's a priority thing. It's a priority thing. So, um, exercise has to be first and foremost because it, uh, if you're not taking care of yourself, you can't take care of anybody else, right? Uh, what's the point of doing all this work and trying to accumulate all this money or do it if you're not if you're not mm -hmm. healthy? So, um, so it's got to be first and foremost, first thing in the morning, no matter what's going on, I have to do my workout. I'm sure you're the same way. I have to do something. I also think there's a problem with our instant gratification culture, right? So yeah, you're enthusiastic about your goal, but when you're, you're not seeing immediate results or the results that you want in a dramatic fashion in a pretty short period of time, people lose enthusiasm for it. You mean a hundred pounds overweight, I don't have a six pack in two weeks? Right, yeah, that <laughs> right. thing. Right. And I think we, we overestimate what we can accomplish in short periods of time. And we're not wired to think more long-term about these things. But I think one thing that, that you've done very well is you need all of those things to create that level of engagement. But at some point, you develop the habit and the practice to be doing them just because this is who I am and this is what I do. It's not necessarily tied to a date on the calendar. It just becomes your value set and who you are. Well, there's no doubt about it that you have to um, put on a board, put on a bunch of post-its around the house if they still even sell post-its, I don't know. And um, what are your values? What are, the, what are the things you stand for? What do you wanna stand for? And then make sure that your actions every day align with that. Um, two days ago, I was in Florida. I went into, uh, in Lake Nona, is uh, attempting to be this health and wellness, uh, I have to get you down there, this health and wellness capital of the country. Uh -huh. And uh, they have a- part of Florida? Uh, Orlando, funny enough, right mm -hmm. by the airport, 17,000 acres that uh, they got uh, Deepak Chopra there. They brought in um, a bunch of companies all around health and wellness. So I'm down there and they wanna test me in their performance center. And I'm not like, it's three in the afternoon. I just had lunch. I already did a two hour workout in the morning. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like doing this thing. And it's the first time ever that I've like pushed back and I could see everybody's face. Like, this is Joe, the Spartan guy. He doesn't want it. It's like, fuck it, all right, I'm doing it. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and I did it because, because of exactly what you said. Like, that's who I am. I'm supposed to do yeah. the hard things when I don't want to. I asked the whole world to do the hard things when they don't want to. So I got on the bike and I did the 40 minute test. They checked, you know, lactate threshold or whatever. And I felt better. There's no, the only bad workout is the one you don't do. Mm. I've never not felt better at the end of it. Mm. Never. I've never felt not felt better at the end of a cold shower. It sucks getting in, but getting out, you feel alive. You do that every day still? Every day. Yeah. And it sucks. <laughs> it doesn't Sucks. get easier. It never gets better. Yeah. Sucks. Do you do the uh the ice baths and all of that, the plunging? When there's when there's a place for me to plunge into, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um one of the things that you talk about in the book is this different, I mean it's all about resilience, so we should define resilience, but you you define resilience in contrast to this idea of like true resilience. So maybe define resilience and why true resilience is something a little bit different. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people talk about, um, and, I've, and I've evolved actually since I've, I've written the book with this concept, which a lot of people just think it's just that ability to you know, stand there and take the beating, right? And be able to bounce back. But, but I also think it's the ability to pivot, right? And move because we could get so stuck in our ways. I've had many failures in my life because of that. Like you're just so obstinate that mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not going to move. Um, that you've got to be open-minded enough um, to make a left or make a right or, or or do something a slightly different because whatever you were doing is not working. However, it's really important that you keep in mind your mind will play tricks on you. Uh, you know this as good as anybody else. I, I've had call it 10,000 conversations with individuals doing our races one-on-one. -on -one. And um, they pivot, quit um, at times when they didn't need to mm -hmm. because their mind was playing a trick on them. And I like to say, if you and I were climbing Mount Everest, let's say, and um, my value system was to be the greatest climber that ever lived. And this was my window when you and I were 100 feet from the summit. Uh, this was my window to set the world record. Uh, you, your value system was to be the greatest family man that ever lived, have the greatest podcast ever, 
and um, we're both about to go and the weather gets bad, um, I probably should go for it, no matter how mm -hmm. I'm feeling, because I got a different value system. You probably should turn around and go down. You want to be the best, right? So you got to have um, enough resilience. You got to be able to, to really reflect and, and dive into what's going on in your head and say, am I quitting because it's just hard? Or, or am I quitting because it aligns or pivoting because it aligns with my, my value system? So it's it's being open-minded and true to yourself enough um, to be able to answer that question correctly. Yeah, I think that's a really important point to make because in the context of fitness, you have fitness fanatics who set a goal and they become very you know narrowly focused on that. But maybe they have kids or they have they have they, their value set is broader than just performance in that one specific realm but they kind of push all their chips into that for a short period of time. And resilience in that context means, you know, being flexible or less rigid when, hey, listen, you know, you gotta go to the recital today. Like you're not gonna be able to do that workout that's in your training program and not like losing your mind over that. That's I a, see a, a lot of that. So much we think of resilience as like, you gotta be tough and you gotta be able to go out when it's pouring rain and freezing, but it works the other way same time because you know most people are not professional athletes no you you use the, the better word than i did which would be less rigid mm -hmm. and and um i see it a lot in business right i want to hire um a lot of people at the company that really believe in the brand but um there are some that really believe in the brand that don't really want to work and that's that's a tough one to understand because if they're crawling under barbed wire and they're running every day and they clearly want to work but that's fun in some mm -hmm. ways, you know what I mean? The hard work is going to the recital maybe, yeah. <laughs> or, or sitting down and doing the emails. And, and so you do have to be um, less non-rigid enough to be able to um, do it all, Yeah. right? How do you think about um, rest and recovery and kind of periodizing all of this, um, given that the fact that we, you know, we all live like busy lives and we have multiple things competing for our attention. Um, you know, I think on the surface level, you could strike somebody as being the guy who's like the hustle porn guy. And like, you, can, you've, you, you never stop, you just keep going until your body just completely breaks and you got nothing left to give. Well, I, I mean, again, my, my ideas around this, my intelligence around this have evolved. Um, the, fir the, the first from the guy who like did 50 ultras in a year and almost like blew up his marriage <laughs> yeah i i am um, oh, my wife is amazing that she's still with me but but um i my my statement to that had you asked that question five years ago is i'll i'll, I'll rest when i die mm -hmm. right my exit strategy is death right um, what are you are you like what are you like 52 now 52, or something? Yeah. 52 yeah and and i'm um i'm tired <laughs> but, I, but i've I've, I've, I've lived three lives in one, yeah. you know? And so I, my assistant thinks I'm a lunatic, right? Because if I'm coming to LA to see Rich Roll, we could squeeze three other meetings in, mm -hmm. right? And then I could get on a red eye and go home. And so rest has never been a priority. I, I sleep when I can, not when I have to. So if I'm on a plane, pass out, wherever I am, I'm just falling asleep to catch up and then just get recharged. People refer to me. Uh, as the guy like on a phone battery that always is really close to running out of juice, yeah. but never, but never <laughs> quite dies. You just did like 8% all, all the time. All the time. And, and, um, and then I had a Navy SEAL who's a sleep expert on, on the podcast recently. And he's, he was the same way. And the Navy SEALs were the same way. And he tried to talk um, to the folks um, that are in charge of the Navy SEALs. And they all laughed at him. He's like, you know, I think we should, we should have them sleep a little more. They should take mm. naps. And they laughed them out of the room, mm. which you would get. I would have laughed them out of the room, right? Um, you need eight hours. I think here's what I came to the conclusion. Ready for this? Your, your audience is going to love this. You and I should go on this mantra. We, and this is from my buddy Nick Morris two days ago. We need to set our alarm clocks for when to go to bed, not to wake up. That's a super interesting idea. We have it backwards. If you set your alarm for that time to go to bed, you should never need to set the alarm to wake up. Yeah, and that's, I early. think our problem in the last week, 
since I was on with the Navy SEAL, I've been in bed by no, no later than 9 p.m. Mm -hmm. um, on my own, I was up at four and change this morning, like no problem, you know? So if, if it starts to bleed into 10, 10 30, 11 for some people, who knows what time for others, yeah. it's too late. Yeah. And the thing, you know, for the younger people listening, when you get older, uh, I'm I'm waking up at four four thirty no matter what, yeah. so I better go to bed at nine because I'm just I just wake I I can't sleep in no sure. matter what so I it, it's super important to me to be in bed at nine. So we should we should start this narrative that um, everybody's got it wrong. You got to set your alarm clock at night. I like that uh, to go to bed and and I I don't know if you believe this but I believe this. There's really nothing good that happens after ten p.m. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> what what are you possibly yeah. doing after 10 p.m.? Yeah. Now they have the, you could meet a girl or a guy online. You don't even need to like go to a bar or right. anything. Right, right. Sorry to interrupt the flow. We'll be right back with more awesome. But first, I do wanna snag a quick moment to talk about something I care a lot about, which is the importance of nutrition. And the thing is, most people I know actually aspire to eat better, to incorporate more whole plants, fruits, vegetables, seeds, beans, and legumes into their daily regimen. Sadly, however, without the proper tools and support, very few end up sticking with it. And so, because adopting a plant-based diet transformed my life so profoundly, and because I want everyone to experience some version of what I've experienced, we decided to tackle and solve this very common problem. And the solution we've devised, I'm proud to say, is the Plant Power Meal Planner, our affordable all-in-one digital platform that sets you up for nutrition excellence by providing access to thousands of customizable, super delicious, easy to prepare plant-based recipes. Everything integrates with automatic grocery delivery. You get access to our team of amazing nutrition coaches seven days a week and many, many other amazing features. To kickstart your health intentions this new year, we're offering you $20 off a one-year membership with the code POWER20 throughout the entire month of January. Again, that's promo code POWER20 for $20 off at meals.richroll.com. All right, back to the pod. So let's get into these um, principles for resilience. You, got, you have 10 of them, right? Um, and the first one is you can't until you can't. I mean, they're all like, just Stop. Listen, it's obvious. I read this book and I'm right. like, yeah, I mean, right. I live this and I understand all of these things. Uh, you know, clearly many people don't and, and need it. So it's a service that you're doing this, um, but they're all pretty self-evident. Yeah, I mean, listen, um, we talked about it before. Uh, my kids say it, I'm sure your kids said it when they were growing up, right? I can't do that. And I just say, you can't yet, right? We, we mm -hmm. all- can't do something yet. Um, isn't it amazing, I'm sure you've studied this, where uh, there's a world record broken in running or cycling or whatever, and then all of a sudden, there's 13 more people around sure. the world that break the same record that couldn't be broken for 15 years. So um, it's really our minds that limit us, and uh, the sooner we could teach children uh, they can't yet, uh, the better children we're gonna have. Mm -hmm. So um, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be limiting ourselves on what's possible. There, we should not put limits on the, anything mm -hmm. is possible. My, my, my oldest son will say, well, does that mean I could fly, dad? Well, I mean, the Wright brothers figured it out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? Get on that problem. Yeah. Maybe, you know, <laughs> That's right. just because no one's done it yet. Exactly. Who knows? Um, the idea of living your values is one of them as well. And you touched on that a minute ago. I think I think it's, of an important exercise to be, you know, journaling or connecting with um, what your values are on a on a regular basis because our values are shifting depending upon what's happening. But I think a lot of people just we're not in a culture that is really encouraging us to think about that, right? So I think there's a lot of people who are like, I don't know what my values are. Like, I want to provide for my family and like, you know. I don't know, watch football on the weekend. Like it doesn't go much further than that. So how does one who's never really wrestled with this even begin to unpack what that might mean for them? You know, I, I just had somebody uh, that read the book. I didn't know he had bought the book for his family as young children. He said, I really love this idea of values. My family and I sat down and we, we made a list and, and we were shocked at our oldest son who was like nine and what his values were. And, and so it's really as simple and as hard 
as sitting down with a piece of paper, giving it out uh, to your wife or, or your husband and, and, and the kids, and just taking a stab at it. Like, what are the things that are important to you? What are the things that you value? Do you, do you, uh, you and the family want to be incredibly healthy? Do you want to be known as the hardest working family on the block? Well, what are the things that, that are going to move the needle? What, if, you, if this was a thousand years ago and you had a family crest, what would the saying yeah. be? on that crest, you know? And so for us, for me, one of the big things is like, I don't care win or lose guys, but we gotta be known as the hardest working family on the planet. Like I can't have this business out there where I'm telling people like, we don't quit. Yeah, but what if your kids have a completely different set of values and they're like, that's good for you, but that ain't what the, the life I'm living. Well, I don't care who you are. Um, you should be a hard worker, right? I remember my son, um, had, was skiing. We were in the ski program at Killington because they grew up on a farm in yeah. Vermont. And um, I go in, it's nice. The parents get to go in and have lunch with their children. So they go ski all morning with the ski instructors, come in, have lunch, and then they go out again for the second half of the day. And the lady says to me, um, oh, your son, he um, he's already in. I said, but it's only 1130. I, I thought it was, oh, well, he was cold. He came in early and I was so furious, right? But I had to temper myself. Oh, it's tough to be your kid, man. <laughs> I know, right? I have compassion <laughs> for your kids. And I go over. If they and I'm want like, to come and like live with me for a while. I'm gonna I'm gonna expand yeah. on that for a second. So I'm like Jack, um, and he's he know he knows right uh -huh. something's coming. He's, he's probably trouble. six years old at the time. I go, what? Well, I was really cold. I said, oh, you know what? This team might not be the right team for you. You're on my ski team now. Let's go. <laughs> let's go. No. Let's go outside. Let's put our skis on. on. We've got a half hour before lunch. Come on. And he puts the skis on and I proceed to penguin walk up the mountain with him. And we're walking up. What are we doing? I said, oh, well, my ski team, we don't take chairlifts. You'll never be cold again. And we're <laughs> we oh, up the whole mountain. <laughs> and I, isn't this great? You never have to go on that ski team again. We work so hard. He never wanted to be on my team, my ski team again, yeah. but- but He's gonna tell that story to his therapist. <laughs> for sure, my wife says that all the time, but but I, I want us to be hard workers. Obviously the parents have an influence on what the family values are. I don't think you could take a six-year-old and expect like, you know what I mean? You've got to guide that a little bit, mm -hmm. right? They don't have a prefrontal cortex yet, so it's not like they're gonna spit out uh, perfect values. Um, at that point, you got to guide it a bit. Um, I think there's a practicality challenge here too. It's one thing if you've been doing this all along since your kids were really little, and they're act, they're like, okay, this is this is what we do, and this is this is Dad's deal. But you come in hot when your kids are like 14, 15, They ain't having it. That's a fair. That's a fair point. Um, there's a there's a book everybody should read called uh, The One Minute Manager. It was written by a guy named Ken Blanchard. And uh, one of his uh, concepts is um, when you manage people, which is like managing children, um, you have to set really tight expectations in the beginning, at the moment that person joins the organization. You can't let them run free and then clamp down the vice grip mm -hmm. seven months later. Does not work, right? They're gonna lose their mind. Same with your point. You can't at 14 years old say, all right, now here's, here's what we're gonna do. You've gotta start laying the, the tracks early on. And I definitely laid tracks early on that we we work hard as a family. We chopped wood, we yeah. we hiked up the mountain. When Charlie was four years old, I might've told you this, when Charlie was four years old, he was um, he was not the most ideal before Christmas. So um, everybody got presents that year, but his presents I put on top of the mountain. And so in his little feety pajamas with snowshoes oh on him, God. we had to go. God, are you kidding me? There was me? a note from Santa that said, look, Charlie, I'm sorry, but because you didn't give a thousand percent, I couldn't get the, you know, the presents to the house. They're on top of the mountain. Get so out we, of here. Yeah. You <laughs> so, oh my God. So we this is not new. They know, uh -huh. they know what they're getting right. into with us. My wife is definitely um, the softer side. Now I will tell you. Um, well, you know, we put on this death camp on, on, on yeah. the farm, right? And there were many kids at the death camp that would say to me, oh my God, this is so hard. I said, can you imagine what it's like being my kid? When you guys leave and uh -huh. you get to go home, <laughs> my kids, right. this is their home. I wanna, I wanna read their book <laughs> right. when they're 28. Yeah. Um, 
but uh, you got to get value straight. Yeah, values are you know. Look, I I completely a thousand percent. I'm on board with that. I mean, I think the tricky thing that I've experienced as a parent is the the balance between like setting the hard boundary and what happens when you know that expectation isn't met. How hard do you come down on that kid? Because especially when they're in those teenage years, like the communication is so critical and I don't wanna do anything that's gonna shut that down. And if I come in really hot, I risk them just clamping down and then they're not telling me what's going on in their life anymore. And, it, it and keeping what, that communication open, I think is critical when they're trying to figure out how to navigate you know, their social circles and drugs and alcohol and the temptations that teenagers face. Like I want them to feel like they can come and talk to me about that stuff. But if I'm too disciplinarian, then they're then they're gonna I'm not gonna be the guy that they're gonna come to when they need to like clear that stuff. Well, in our family, and I didn't go in with this plan, it just happened. Um, so it's a good model to use. My wife is the pressure relief valve. So they'll go to my wife mm. and they'll open up and talk to her about anything. There's no doubt about it that based on my communication and our family, they know that I'm hardcore and I have high expectations. I've tried really hard to explain that my expectations aren't, I don't care if you get A pluses. I really, they, by the way, they're all striving for A. Like, I, I, I didn't get A's, I right. got C's. They all like speak Mandarin and stuff. They all speak Mandarin, right. they do extra math, but, but it's not, I know some people are rolling their eyes that might be listening, it's like, Again, I, I we don't take tests in Mandarin where my expectation, you've got to do this or that. No, you just got to, it's kind of like you got to exercise a little bit each day. You got to speak another language with, mm. with a teacher every day. Well, They're, the Mandarin thing started because your daughter came to you and said, I want to learn Mandarin, right? It was a little It was a little bit of that. It was, um, we had a Kung Fu master living in the house, which was, which was it was another how, story. How old were they then? <laughs> they were very young. Um, I saw the movie Kill Bill when they were young <laughs> and Uma Thurman had a Kung Fu master. Uh -huh. And I turned to my wife and I said, wouldn't it be unbelievable if we had a Kung Fu master living on the farm? So I called a friend of a friend of a friend and I convinced a guy to come from China who uh, didn't speak any English uh -huh. and, and uh, would train them every day in Kung Fu. And then my daughter said, hey, I'd love to learn. And so then, we, then it started. Uh, so, did you take the Kung Fu also? I didn't. You didn't? I didn't, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a wimp. I, um, what did they learn from that? Discipline, tremendous discipline. And it's really, the Kung Fu is, is kind of like almost gymnastics, if you will. So. They had gymnastics class with a Mandarin speaking master mm -hmm. for uh, three or four years before we switched to traditional sports. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think from all of this, if you could drill down on the message, it's really like get in the habit of doing hard things, learn how to face your fears and walk through them. Don't be afraid when you fall down, like failing is part of this whole thing, get used to it, acclimate to it. and and just develop that skill set where you're used to facing obstacles and weathering through them because life is hard and you're gonna have to deal with that at some point. And so if you're doing your pushups figuratively and literally, um, you're just in a better position to be able to roll with whatever life throws at you and basically zig, zig when everyone's zagging and try the hard things that no one else is you know, wanting to tackle. So two, two responses to that. One, you're dead on. Um, you, just, you just triggered a thought. So as the Kung Fu master was teaching my kids in the barn every single day for four years, my, my um, cousin lives next door to the farm uh -huh. and they have uh, their first child. And so I said, well, I'm paying for this Kung Fu master. Bring as many kids as possible, right? It's good, it's good yeah. for me too, because my kids wouldn't be alone. She happened to walk in the barn one day and the kids were crying because like it's hard. Mm. And she extracted her son from the program, never to come back to the Kung Fu master. Last night, I got a text from her. He's now a high school wrestler. He wrestled up a weight. He pinned his kid. They're proud like, so it's hard. It's hard to put the kids in those situations that are, that are tough. 
But now, now she's recognizing mm-hmm. the value of doing, you know, any chance I get, I've, I've taken him into our program. Right. And now she recognized that her husband was more like you. Her husband had a really tough upbringing. I don't want, I, the kids should make their own decisions. I don't want to disrupt the possible two-way communication between us. If they don't want to do Kung Fu, let's not have them do the, if they don't want to do wrestling, that doesn't really develop the muscle to your point, the muscle they're gonna need to fight through life. Mm -hmm. When 45 countries get shut down, you furlough 400 people, you're about to go bankrupt five times in a row during COVID, like, thank God I had that muscle. Yeah. Right? Pay now, love it later. There's a a better one. I I, I picked up a hitchhiker one day. He said to me, um, save the fun for later. Yeah. That's a great line. (laughs) My wife and everybody, everybody, my kids, they want to have fun. I say, save the fun for later. (laughs) Yeah. That's one of the the principles in the book, right? Basically, you know, fun comes after the work, do the work first, then you get the fun. And, and I think maybe that piece is getting missed here. You're, you're all about the fun. You're not like, you know, you're not the great Santini, I guess is what I'm saying. Not the great Santini. And I, you know, if you watch the movie 300, and it's not unique to me, this is 2,500 years ago, they're joking in the face of adversity. And if you go to any Spartan race around the world, the racers are dying out there, but they're joking and they're having fun with it in the middle of the desert. And they're, You know what I mean? So you can have, I have fun with it. I have fun with it. Yeah, well, that's another thing that I think gets missed, this idea that hard things means that you're gonna have to be this martyr and you're you're just gonna be punishing yourself. But we experience joy in doing hard things. That's what we're wired to do. But our society is set up to give us a completely different message that obviously we're realizing is moving away from that joyous state that we seek, that we can feel and express, even though it's hard, we all know what it's like in the aftermath of doing something hard and that feeling of satisfaction and the, conviviality that you have with the people that you've done it. And that's what we're missing. I mean, that's what Spartan really you know, does. It serves people in such a meaningful way for that. Okay. Here's a question for you. <clears throat> Anybody listening, do you think your children at the end of their life would say, man, I, I wish my dad had let me sit on the couch more, eat more cotton candy and watch more Netflix. There's no fucking way. What the kid's gonna be talking about, the grandparent at that point, is those amazing stories where, you know, my daughter didn't have boots and we hiked the mountain and got stuck in a snowstorm. <laughs> yeah, you tell survived. that story in the book. <laughs> I'm like, that seems a little extreme. That wasn't planned. Yeah. But, but it happened. So like those, but those are the stories, right? That you tell, you, you probably tell about yourself, those amazing stories where you fought through. Sure, for myself, but I can't say that I've like, you know, kind of recruited my kids into that world, like they're not interested in what I'm doing. And I've, I've struggled to get them, you know, interested in some aspect of the things that like get me out of bed in the morning, but it's tough, man. You probably started too late to your point. Yeah. And you were probably overly sensitive because of the way you grew up. And my kids are great and they're all doing really well. It's just, they don't share this interest in this kind of stuff that I do. And, the and I don't that, need them to. Yeah. And it's sort of wired that way. Like your yeah. kids become your teachers because you think like, oh, I'm gonna, they're gonna be little mini me's and they're gonna wanna do all this shit. It doesn't work that way. No. And, and it shouldn't work that way. And the jury's out, right? Like if, if you still have me once a year on your podcast, in 10 years, we might find out that right. my kids are all artists and yeah. they, right? And they don't. Right. Or you just, you come over to my house for Christmas and you're the Christmas gift for the kids <laughs> and you live with me. <laughs> See what happens. <laughs> That's right. I can't get them to your Vermont farm, but I can bring you to my house. I could do that. <laughs> I could come over, yeah. no problem. Yeah. Um, let's talk about failure a little bit more. And we, we touched on it. Um, we're so afraid of failing. We're afraid of, 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 of looking bad um, amongst our peers. And it prevents us from trying these hard things. Like we're so caught up in our you know self image that it hamstrings us from just getting out there and letting go of all of that stuff and understanding that developing a healthy relationship for failure is really the only true path to success in anything. Well, it's just part of the process. You gotta fail. Uh, my son, 
during COVID, I pushed my two boys really hard, like beyond what we're talking mm. about here in wrestling, because we had the time, like crazy uh-huh. training, trying to catch up because of all those years doing Kung Fu, we got behind on wrestling. And um, my son didn't do well at a tournament and he was like a little depressed about it. And I said, well, you only have to lose like another 700 matches <laughs> before you get good. Like that's just yeah. part of the deal. And and once you recognize that like, you know, think about Edison with the light bulb, what, what the famous saying, right? No, I didn't learn how to make a light bulb once. I learned how not to make it 900 times. Right. And so that's why I go back to what I said earlier, which is if we could instill a value of hard work, like it's a given we're gonna fail. You and I have to agree mm-hmm. with that, right? That's just the reality of life. It's a given that we're gonna face hard times, that stuff's gonna be challenging. So if those are givens, then um, we have to accept that failure is part of the process, welcome it, talk about it to other people, don't be embarrassed by it, and use it as fuel, use it as stepping stones um, to success. I've probably failed, God, I've probably failed, uh, you know, 40 times in building this business. 40 times. Yeah. Check this uh, stat out. I didn't know, you know, I, I told you I have this TV show we're working on. Um, I didn't know 95% of businesses fail in the first 15 years of existence. 95%. Is that right? It's unbelievable. Yeah. The longer you play the game, the more likely you die. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so, right, like you better get used to failure. But getting used to it, um, is an interesting discussion. Your your co-author, Dr. L, I think sh- she's the one who talks about this in the book. These, it's really about the story that we tell ourselves about what that failure means. And that story often depends upon or is dictated by, you know, kind of your 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 blueprint or your past experiences or your kind of presets, like are you an optimistic person? Are you a pessimistic person? And people that are very defeatist about their their failures are you know people who are caught up in that kind of negative self-image narrative. Um, so to reframe your relationship with failure it almost involves like some reprogramming around your neuroplasticity so that you can frame it as just, this is good, I failed because everybody who succeeds fails. So maybe I'm on my way to succeeding, right? No, and, and that's what I tried to explain to Jack, my son, right? Like, like so what? You fa- you have to fail so many times to succeed. So let's look at all the winners in life across any you know, discipline. It doesn't matter, sports, business, relationships. Like, you got to fail a lot mm-hmm. in order to succeed. And once, once the world accepts that, I think we'll be a better place. We won't, it won't be a dirty word. Right. Right. Um, on the subject of, of, of uh, wrestling, you have two kids that wrestle or one? Two, two boys. Two, two that wrestle. Um, one, of the, one of the rules in your book is earn, not given. So I, I, if I could be so bold, I suspect that like, you're not a big fan of participation trophies, right? No, <laughs> not, not at all. And I, I don't think the kids are, I don't, yeah. I don't believe the kids are big fans of participation. Well, there was, I wanted to throw this one at you for your reaction, because I think it's super interesting. Um, Jordan Burroughs, you know, I know Jordan very well. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. I, I met him recently. I did a speaking engagement in Illinois and got to spend some time with him. Like, what a wonderful guy! Like, yeah. I'm just an amazing champion. Um, but he posted on on Instagram or Twitter recently this counter argument. Uh, I mean, Jordan, he's a five time world champion, Olympic gold medalist, um, and he tells this story about getting a participation trophy in like one of his very first wrestling matches and basically said that even though he was like last place or whatever, he was, it, it gave him a level of enthusiasm that like kept him in it. So it's rare that you see somebody who's so accomplished that would offer a counter perspective on that. I had, I had a very similar, the same counter uh, perspective from Rod Dixon, uh, Olympian out of Australia who, who, gave, who said something that I didn't expect, which is what you heard from Jordan which was, um, look, at a certain age, Joe, we got to keep the kids in the game. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then beyond that age, the kids know it and they, they know right. they shouldn't be earning uh, the trophy at that point. And I would say for wrestling, oh my God, it is a tough sport. I mean, you get beat up all yeah. day in practice, you practice to death and then you go and lose. <laughs> that, right. that, that's just yeah. the deal for a long time. So anything that could just make them feel like, oh, cool. Yeah, like I'm all right, I'm, stay I'm, in I'm, it. I'm, I'm just, in the I game. I needed that. I needed that little nudge. 
And and one of the things, um, you, look, it doesn't have to be a participation trophy. It could be not uh, giving the kid that's new uh, a matchup against the kid that's been wrestling for three years, mm -hmm. right? That's that's what you're doing is you're you're actually um, decreasing the amount of kids that would want to wrestle or whatever the right. thing is we're talking about. You have to toggle or calibrate the level of pressure, right? right? And if it's too much, you're just going to burn these kids. You're going to burn the kid out. Yeah. Why would the kid ever yeah. come back right. if he goes in and wrestles like? I always joke with um, with my kids when they're about to go into a tournament, like, oh man, I saw your competition. They just let them out of a cage outside. They were feeding them raw meat, <laughs> beating them. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you guys do well today. Good oh luck. Oh my God. Um, similarly, I can't imagine that you're a fan of the, the four day work week uh, proposal that's going around. Oh you made like God. a little video about this recently. Oh my God, I got, kill <laughs> I got killed for that. You're born out of time, my friend. I am. Um, Here's the thing. I was in China, right? And um, I'm talking as a collective here, not, not individually, but as a collective, um, we compete with the rest of the world, whether we like it or not. And you can't compete a, with a four day work. Like there's just no way. I'm in China mm -hmm. and I'm in this office that has a thousand employees. And the guy, the owner of the company is walking me around and I see a bunch of folks sleeping at their desk. And I'm like, what's up with them? You let them sleep? I'm shocked. And he goes, no, those are the, they do 20 hour days. So every, uh, at lunch, we let them nap for 15 minutes, right? <laughs> and, then, and then I see tents in the corner, actual like North Face type tents in the corner. What, oh, those are the folks that work three days in a row. We let them sleep a little bit in their tents. And so I know, again, I know folks are rolling their eyes and they're saying, oh, Joe, you're like out of touch, baby boom or whatever. And and all I'm saying is be careful what you wish for, because um, if you're going up against, as a country, as a, as a city, whatever, you're going up against a group that's fighting for milk, you're not gonna win. I had a 13-year-old a, a Chinese boy and his mom show up in my office last week. I was leaving the office and I see this boy outside. And I open the door and Mr. DeSanna, yes, I'm one of the Spartans from China. Hmm. It's a true story. I'm one of the Spartans from China. I came with my mom. He's got the book. Yeah. I read the book. I've done 10 of the races in China. I wanted to come meet you. You've changed my life. There's not many American kids and their moms jumping on planes and going to China. Like, you wow. know, you can't compete. He came to America. He came to America. Mainly to meet you. Yeah. Unbelievable. Wow. So, so uh, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm, I'm just saying like that attitude we are, the look, hunger. you're gonna get pissed at me. We're fat, lazy, and sick. And, and um, four day work week, go to a two day work week. Why four days? The way I look at it though, just cause of the way I'm wired, if I was working in you know a regular job situation, yep. I would look at that and say, well, that's just more time for me to work out. No, I, of course, I, I, yeah. I like the workout time, um, but, but as a collective, there's very few rich roles, right? Most people don't work out. Most people can't get past January with the New Year's resolution. Mm -hmm. So what are they gonna do? They're gonna sit on the couch more, they're gonna eat more chips, they're gonna watch more TV. That's what we're gonna do. Mm -hmm. And if you don't believe me, look at the stock prices of Facebook, Netflix, go down the list. They're doing pretty well because that's all people consume. What are we gonna do about this, Joe? <laughs> I think this is, is an easy solve. You and I go to the White House, doesn't matter who's in office. I thought about this a lot, I think about it every day. Um, we put a couple of things in place. You ready? Number one, we have to um, do a mandatory draft. There's gotta be like an 18 month, just like Israel, um, military rite of passage. Um, they don't actually have to see war. We don't have to send them um, to some battlefield but they got to go through hell. They got to go through a, a boot camp for 18 months. And we rewire them. We show them what they're capable of. Number two, we got to give credit for people that take care of themselves with insurance providers. So if you take care of yourself, you get like really discounted insurance. Let's motivate people mm -hmm. to get after it. Number three, all you have to do is tax the hell out of junk food. Tax the hell out of it. Everybody that's out there that's a freedom seeker, I get, oh, Joe, this is ridiculous. Government can't be overreaching. Somehow it's okay to wear masks and get vaccinated, but it's not okay to take away Twinkies. I, uh, no problem. So yeah, then, but well, we have to untie the subsidies that artificially keep those products cheap. 
Also. Let's reverse it. Let's use the money from the Twinkie tax and give give uh, to carrot growers. So now carrots <laughs> are, are are less expensive. It's definitely upside down. It's upside down. Yeah. And then the fourth thing is so obvious that I know you'd agree with is let's let's just shut the hot water off across the country. Everybody takes cold showers. <laughs> So easy. <laughs> you need to start your own authoritarian regime and, you know, somewhere near China. <laughs> Make that happen. Uh, yeah. Um, North Korea. Well, the, the, the kind of compulsory service thing. I mean, that's, you know, we live in a culture, in a society that's premised on individualism. And there's something beautiful about that. But I think in the pursuit of that, we lose this respect and appreciation for you know, com the, the common good. And what does it mean to be a member of the, the community? And I think some level of compulsory, you know, service would, would solve that because we don't have those rites of passage that we used to have. We have to artificially create them in the form of Spartan races because we lack that in our heritage as something that young people do in this transition be between being children and adults. There is, in Israel, there's a, if you meet uh, Israelis, there's a tremendous bond created because they all go through that. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not saying Americans aren't bonded uh, together, although we are attacking each other every chance we get, right, on social media and everything else. Um, it would be amazing. And it's so simple to execute these things. It's, uh, anyway, I, yeah. I'm really furious about the whole thing. Tell me about this TV show. So, um, a couple of years ago, right before the pandemic, I got a call from CNBC. I'm not supposed to talk about it, so don't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. And um, they love this message that you and I are bought into and said, could you apply it to business? So I said, yeah. So just like we talk about 10 rules of resilience um, for families, um, we, we do it for business. So I go in, I meet a business, I ascertain where they are, what the issues are, bring them back to the farm in Vermont, mm. beat the shit out of them, um, hopefully to focus on those three issues, highlight them and uh, send them back and then check in with them in three months. So it's uh, if you could, it's like a shark tank um, with a little bit of survivor oh, and a little cool. bit of Spartan in it. Yeah. So how, are, it, it hasn't come out yet though, has it? You're it, shooting it right it'll now? It'll launch in um, February. Uh-huh. Yeah, cool, we're man. filming right now. It's It's been, um, Outside of nearly going bankrupt five times with Spartan through the pandemic, it's been one of the hardest things to do. I film, we've filmed now for like 55 days. Mm. And they all come out to the farm. And they all come out you to the farm. You make them run up the mountain too? Well, so I, we design tasks specifically designed, you know, to, to highlight that particular issue that company's having. And every company has issues. So, yeah. so companies are nervous about exposing their dirty laundry, but like, I have issues, you mm -hmm. have issues, you're, like we all have issues. Mm -hmm. and, and we tend to avoid dealing with those issues because of what we, we said earlier. We don't wanna be uncomfortable, right? Right. So we keep doing the things that are comfortable and, and not paying attention to the things that aren't, and then you end up like Kodak. Mm -hmm. Right, doubling down on, on your strengths and not paying attention not, to your weaknesses that ultimately become the undoing exactly. of the whole thing. What's it called? It's called um, No Retreat. No because retreat. because a company would normally go on a retreat and uh -huh. they go to spa or whatever. This is the furthest no thing from, from a retreat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's some good stories coming out of that. It's incredible. Yeah, it's been it's been uh, very very hard, very challenging, but but incredible. What happened with the? We talked about this last time. The documentary that you were doing with Cal Fussman. So that came out. Oh, it did. Yeah, yeah that we put that out. Oh, I didn't even. Yeah, see you're it. you're out. You're in oh, you're in there. I got. I'll send you a link. Yeah. I want yeah. to see that. I'll link it up in the show notes. Yeah. So anybody that knows Cal, Cal um, was one of my tougher patients. He, um, amazing writer, right? From Esquire magazine, been, been around forever, mm -hmm. knows everybody, uh, wanted to lose weight. Um, but he and I were like the odd couple. I had him with me for about 18 months and I would just torture him and try to get him away from ice cream and make him work out. And he would say, why, Joe, you need to relax more and smell the roses. And so it was that constant tension. Right. During, during the and whole thing. And he's sort of comic relief too. Yeah. He does it with tongue in cheek. He does it tongue in cheek, but, but um, and seems to be okay being in the middle. The foil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, are you still having people come out to the farm to train and stuff like that? People, people come out to the farm. Um, I would say once a week we get a call or an email and then 
let's say uh, there's 50 people a year that reach out. Of the 55 actually show up. There was a kid that showed up this summer um, on a used bicycle. He, he was at Babson, mm-hmm. needed a change, bicycled from, um, from Boston to Vermont, 300 plus miles, lived on the farm all summer. Wow. Ended up winning the death race. Wow. Completely transformed. He couldn't finish the kid's death race we did. We put him in the kid's death race, couldn't finish it. Uh, came back for the adult one licked his wounds and uh, and ended up winning it. Wow. Is Vice- he the kid that's in the book? You tell the story about him Mike? where the, I think the, like the mom wanted to pull him out or something no, like that. No, different, that's a different kid. Mm. Yeah. Well, we had a big problem with, with parents, with kids texting their parents and saying, this guy, Joe is nuts. This farm is a prison camp. Um, you got to get us out of here. And there were some parents that pulled the ripcord that mm-hmm. came out and, parachuted their children out and ultimately regret it because um it wasn't that bad i mean carrying yeah, a rock your your perspective on that is not no, normal no look i could think of an instance right one night where we had the kids on the farm and for those that don't know because rich and i just dove into it it was um many weeks uh we had a one-week course uh, a two-week course there's many weeks where uh, I would invite friends and family, Rich's kids, let's say, would come, uh, billionaire's kids, um, inner city kids, whoever I could I could convince to come to the farm. And um, Mountain Warfare School drill instructor wakes them up at five in the morning. It's just like you would envision a boot camp. They're in cold water in the pond. They're getting screamed at. They're getting organized. They're learning you know, some basic um, things that everybody should know. And then... Uh, they're getting breakfast. They're hiking up and down the mountain most of the day. At some point, we give them a, an hour in the river where they get to play and frolic around in the mm-hmm. river and then back to w- hard work. And they go to bed at like 8 p.m. every night. Well, I would give them their phones back at night and I, I didn't realize that they were texting their parents. Like, this guy's nuts. You got to get me out of here, prison mm-hmm. camp. And some parents that were friends of mine wouldn't engage. With the kids like one one it's hilarious to read this one set of parents that said oh it sounds like a peloton class right. <laughs> the, kid, the kid is like f you you don't even know how hard this is you and dad would die if you uh-huh. were here oh but you'll get a six-pack <laughs> get me out of here or oh, do you want us to talk to joe do not talk to joe you clearly don't know him he's a crazy <laughs> person if he knows that i texted you those texts would be taking place at a time at night where I might be giving them ice cream because they had a great job. They did a great job that night. Mm -hmm. So juxtapose, you know, I'm seeing a visual of them having a good time and they're texting like the the sky is falling. Right. And so you got to beware, right? Because kids know how to push buttons. And, And if we constantly rescue them from I didn't sign them. They didn't join the Chinese military. Right. Right. This is like, come on, I'm a normal person. (laughs) Kind of. One of the things that you do with these kids uh, or just any of these people that have come, you know, come through the farm, and I'm sure you do this out on the Spartan race courses, is when they, when they reach that point of saying, I'm going to quit, you're like, okay, just go 10 more meters, then you can quit. It's totally fine. And just get them to like, it's back to that like little digestible, you know, step that you can take to shake free of whatever that like mindset is that is telling you that you're done. I learned that from a, a woman named Lisa Smith uh, years and uh, 25 years ago, 27 years ago. I, I was learning how to run these long distance runs. Mm-hmm. And um, I said, I just want to quit. She was running with me and she said, well, why don't we just run to that telephone pole? And then you run to the next telephone pole. And before you know it, you've run to 870 telephone poles and you got the job done. And so it is, it has to be bite-sized chunks because it's just too big for the brain, especially a kid's brain. Um, yeah, you could quit, but not until later today. Yeah. Later today, we have the quitting bus coming. Mm-hmm. Oh, it didn't come tonight. Tomorrow you can quit. I'm sure the bus will be here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, with all the people that have come through the farm and all the you know people that you've touched through Spartan, what do you think, like when you, if you have to extrapolate from that like data set of human beings, 
you know, what are the themes or the kind of commonalities or sort of things that you see time and time again, where people are, you know, mis- like losing the plot or like failing to see what's right in front of them that could free them. I'm in Abu Dhabi two weeks ago and a guy comes up, very common, guy comes up and he, and he Joe, oh my God, I read your book. I, don't say anymore, come with me. And I, I go get a camera because I've seen this play mm-hmm. 10,000 times. We get a little camera rolling or a phone, somebody's holding a phone. And I said, all right, tell me the story. He said, I'm from Idaho and I've never left. Um, I'm a farmer, farmer's son, married my wife, high school sweetheart. And I look down as he's telling me and he's missing his leg. I didn't even notice. And so I said, what happened to your leg? He said, I got run over by a tractor, um, married my, my high school sweetheart. We're both about a hundred pounds overweight. Uh, because of that, uh, we kept trying. She couldn't have children, but her body wasn't working. Mm. Um, somebody gave us the book. Never left Idaho in my life. Read the book, started doing Spartan races. We both lost a hundred pounds. We had three children, right? He goes, um, my third child is three and a half years old and he starts tearing up. He said, uh, she died. She fell in a pool, she drowned. He said, but I have no regrets. Of course I miss her, I have no regrets. I did all these Spartan things. I hiked with her, I carried her. We rode bicycles together and he's all teared up as he's telling the story. And he says, now I'm in Abu Dhabi because I never left Idaho. Mm. And so that's typically, you hear stuff like that. Like the person developed the muscle we spoke about earlier. Um, They face something hard because we all face, it doesn't matter, we're all gonna face something hard. They felt like they they had a little more strength to get through it. Um, There's usually a great health and wellness story. I gave up drinking, I gave up drugs. Um, there's usually a love story. I'm back with my husband. Mm-hmm. I'm back with my wife. Um, and I, I scratch my head sometimes and I'm like, it's only an obstacle race, but, but it's not, it's, it's those obstacles. They emulate, uh, life's challenges and, and they force people to do stuff and travel to places that they otherwise never would have. And it's rich. It's different than a triathlon and it's different than a marathon because in a triathlon, in most cases, and you could disagree with me. Um, we would get so caught up in that, that you start saving four ounces on your bike seat Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. you buy that special wetsuit that's gonna take a minute off your swim time. But that really was never what it was about. It was about pushing yourself past perceived limits. And and that doesn't exist out there in Spartan. There's no bike seat that's gonna, you know what I mean? It's just like- Just you and you. Just you and you, and you gotta grind through and somehow get this done, Mm -hmm. so. So for the person who's, you know, listening to this, sitting on the couch saying, God damn it. Like, I just can't live this way anymore. Like I've got to make this change. I, but I don't really know where to start. Like, how do you get people? Like, what's that first step to like cattle prod them out of that mindset and that, you know, paralysis? Well, first thing is we, we, we all have to agree that our brains, our reptile brains are gonna help, are gonna force us to avoid um, discomfort, anything uncomfortable. So we're gonna fight face resistance every day. Uh, number two, you gotta have a date on the calendar. And I'm not selling you a race ticket. You could email me, joe at spartan.com. I'll give you the race ticket, I don't care. Like you just gotta have a date on the calendar. Um, it could be a 5K, it could be could be learning a new language. You gotta have something hard um, where there's, there, there's that payday. Um, and then you just gotta do it in bite-side chunks. You gotta do it every single day. You gotta scream from the rooftops to your friends and family. Every year I put on the death race. Death race is the hardest race we have. Mm-hmm. And I've been doing it, call it 20 years. And every year, like 300 people sign up, 90 grandmothers would die the night before the race. Somehow, you know, everybody's grandmother died. They couldn't, <laughs> they couldn't show up. And, um, and then when they get there, of, of, of the remaining, you know, call it 210 people, 105 of them quit, you know, a gear check, mm-hmm. right? The first few hours. And I got so frustrated with it. I said, look, you're not allowed to do this race unless you get an article written in a local paper. If you get an article written in a local paper, I know you're serious. And then you're on yeah, the hook. Right. And all Your of a whole sudden, town knows that you're doing the it. The whole town knows you're doing it and you're gonna finish. It has to say, you're doing the death race and you're gonna finish. Uh-huh. And now you're gonna be held accountable by all your friends and family. And all of a sudden, Rich, 
grandmother stopped dying. People started finishing the race. So you gotta, you gotta scream it from the rooftops. You gotta ask friends and family to hold you accountable and, um, and you'll get it done. And I, how do I, 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 10 million people have done one of these events. That 10, many. 10 million people. Wow. It's, it's a fraction when you look at 7 billion mm-hmm. people on earth, but, but, um, but it's a big enough sample set that it works. Yeah. So death race, I mean, we talked about this last time, but correct me if I'm wrong. Do you change the course every time and you don't tell people like when you're starting or you know they don't know what they're getting involved in? They don't know when it's gonna end or how far it is or any of that. They right? don't know anything. And, and the reason so is- So it's a total mind fuck. Well, and the reason is, this is really important is because um, here I am, I launch my races again. We're out of the pandemic and Omnicon shows up. Mm-hmm. Oh. Like, <laughs> whatever the hell it's called, <laughs> right? Uh-huh. So, so you don't know in life like what's gonna what's gonna happen, right? And so, why life, would, the, life is the death race. Life is a death race. So, um, I purposely did that because people will train and they'll be like, getting the four ounce lighter weight seat or right. the or the better wetsuit. They can't with right. death race. It's a control thing. You want to be able to control all the variables. And the whole purpose of death race is to say you can't control this. No. What does it feel like to be totally out of control? Yeah, I would see videos of how the whole group, the whole uh, class that's coming in that year is training. And I would say, oh great, we're not doing any of that then. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. If you're training for the death race, don't show don't share it on social media. That's right. That's a surefire way of making sure that you're training improperly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. How many people sign up for that? About 300. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is your sense of, of like what COVID is doing to young people? Like it's been obviously very difficult for young people. They're, you know, having to navigate through those formative years, like these sorts of setbacks and challenges. And you can look at it from one perspective, which is how terrible and how awful. But on some level, the flip side of that is they're being fa- they're being sort of compelled to develop resilience around certain things that like we didn't have to when we were that age and everything was just kind of like normal. Well, I mean, a couple, a couple of thoughts I have on it. One is I, I tried like how for our family to um, just make it business as usual, mm-hmm. uh, continue to, to, uh, to study every day, can, you know, take off your pajamas in the morning, do all the stuff we used to do, we never stopped doing. Um, number two, I think, yeah, it was a challenge, but I mean, I, I don't know. I think, I think we, we as parents, we as adults need more than ever to, um, to get these kids moving and get them challenged and sign them up for some sport, something. Um, make them learn a new language, make them read more. It doesn't have to be yeah. this book, make them read Rich's stuff, whatever. I think the kids need to know that, um, yeah, school was closed and you had to do you know, stuff on Zoom, but like, I don't know. I think it's our job as parents, as adults to show them. I always show my kids how much worse it could be. Mm-hmm. I got a buddy, Marco, fastest runner in the country on prosthetics. He, uh, he had both, of his, like, both his legs chopped off. It's another story wow. would take us 20 minutes, but he, um, whenever the kids are complaining about anything, let's get Marco on the phone. Mm. How's he doing with his two prosthetics? <laughs> <laughs> you got to do Zoom That's class? That's a ninja move. Yeah. You gotta, yeah. You know? I mean, I think sort of more broadly, you know, this, this swath, this you know, age group of young people, they're being told that the world is a scary place. And when they go to certain places, like their health is at risk. And like, what does that do to their like mentality over time when they're being impulsed or messaged with that constantly? Eat more salad. That's what I tell them. I, like, I'm, you know what I mean? Like I try to show them that news is a business. Food companies are a business. Dad used to work on Wall Street. If we had if Rich and I owned a food company or a news company, and we had we were the most altruistic people on the planet, but we had to make our quarterly numbers, we'd figure out a way to sell more news. We figure out a way to sell more product at a cheaper price. So any chance I get, I try to teach them it's a business. I'm not a conspiracy guy. Mm-hmm. I'm just a reality guy, mm-hmm. right? Um, take care of yourself. That's the best you can do. Uh, I get it. What do you think is uh, like? What is it that? What's your big? 
struggle right now? Like, what is the thing that you're trying to like develop more resilience around or Personally? that you're overcoming? I mean, is it just getting over the hump with the business of, of Spartan or, you know, what is the challenge that you want to take on for my, yourself this year? My biggest challenge right now for the business, which is now, um, I've, I've uh, dropped a bomb on my family, is I can't get anybody to the office, you know? And um, everybody's moved to like, they wanna be on the coast in Maine or mm -hmm. wanna live in Vermont or wanna live here and everybody's re reimagined their priorities, their values. And so maybe I'm old fashioned, but I want everybody in an office, mm -hmm. not seven days a week, right? But like, we should be able to get in the office four days a week. We should be able to build a culture. We should be able to collaborate, work together, share ideas. We do put on, 400 plus events when things are humming. It is a complicated business. Oh, but Joe, um, I waste so much time driving. I could just do it on Zoom or whatever. I get it, but then why, why are we pushing kids to get back in school? Mm -hmm. Why don't they just all do it from their computer? Like there is value to being together. Yeah. So I'm opening an office in Florida. It's not for tax reasons. Uh, I'm hoping that I could get folks together in an office in a in a state where, where folks do still get together. And uh, my family's moving to Florida. Oh, wow. And so my wife wow. is in Florida at this moment, decorating an apartment. Uh, we broke the news to our kids two weeks ago. They're moving to Florida. Wow. And, um, and so it's gonna be a personal challenge and, uh, and a business challenge. Now the Boston office will stay. The 20 people that are coming to do it, you know, that bought, it'll just be a smaller office. Mm -hmm. Um, any new hires uh, will be will take place in Florida, and so wow. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna completely disrupt my life. Um, I'm gonna make it really hard on myself for the business, and that's what we're gonna do. You're not the first. I was just talking to some friends yesterday who are lifelong New Yorkers, and they're getting ready to move to Florida too. Yeah, a lot of people. Yeah, and I, I by the way, I would never move to Florida. It was yeah, never it doesn't seem like the place not, for you. Not a place for me. I would never do it but I was talking to a guy, you're gonna love this, and he's got 80,000 square feet in New York. And we were on the phone three months ago. And I was like, Ryan, I'm losing my mind. I can't get anybody to come to the office. And I, he showed me around his office. There was no one there, mm -hmm. 80,000 mm -hmm. square feet. He said, but like my office- Midtown in, office or something? Downtown. Yeah, downtown. But he goes, my big office in uh, Indianapolis is booming. Everybody shows up to work with their lunch pails. They've been getting, the, they never skip work. And so I flew to Indianapolis because I wanted to see this, <laughs> it was like unbelievable. <laughs> and so I started to explore opening an office in Indianapolis. And um, my friend from Saks Fifth Avenue said, you're an idiot. Wherever, the, wherever you open this office, you have to move to, to get it going. Mm -hmm. Are you gonna live in Indianapolis? And so Florida became mm. the better alternative. Wow, man, that's a big shift. Yeah. Do you ever get the itch to race? And dip your toe back into that, or is that too dangerous? I, I mean, I, no, it's not dangerous. I would love, I would love to race. Um, maybe it's an excuse when I say this, but like, once I started having kids, and I have the business, and you and I talked about resilience before, and the definition of that, how could I, how could I do all three? Because mm -hmm. racing, I was pretty on. Like, I'll see you guys yeah. later, right? I'm, I gotta go to Switzerland Complete. to race. That's what, that's what I meant, like dangerous, like, cause you'll check out. I'll check out. And um, look, I got a little, I got a little fix of my addiction in Abu Dhabi. Mm -hmm. I got to run around the desert, right? Um, I get little, little quick hits going to our races. Um, I was in the Atacama Desert mm -hmm. last year. I, got, I, get, I get to go to cool, right. cool spots and, and, um, and without the, uh, the requirement to put in those, you know, crazy weeks of training away from everybody. Yeah. Um, let's wrap this up with some parting thoughts on resilience, the importance of discipline, all of these um, skills, this toolbox that I think we all, you know, need a little bit more of in our lives if, as we're, you know, contemplating, manifesting, finally, the shit in our lives that we want to see happen. And correct me if I'm wrong, and I'll, we'll leave it with this, like characters in books and in movies, or even if you're listening to a podcast, characters that have um, tremendous discipline and grit and like 
you know, virtue and just stand in the way of everybody and just get the job done. Those are people like we like to Those read are the about. Heroes. Those are the heroes. And so why wouldn't you want to be a hero? And um, it all starts with you, whoever you are listening to this, watch, like be the hero. And, and um, you could do that by walking a mile a day and eating a salad and taking a cold shower. Like it's so easy to be a hero today, <laughs> you know? <laughs> In the four day work week world. <laughs> No, it's never no. been easier to stand out. It's so easy to stand out. So, so I, the parting words would be just be the hero of your story. Think about that kid I just described from Idaho. Um, this is so easy. It's so easy. It would be much harder if this was the Great Depression, World War I, World War II. There were a lot of, there's a lot of competition, mm -hmm. right? Now the competition's a 13 year old Chinese boy that showed up right. at my office. Words to live by. <laughs> You're yeah. awesome. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, people. Um, thanks, buddy. I appreciate you. Um, the book, whether you have kids or not, I think is an instructive roadmap for all the things that we were talking about today. It's really well rendered. So congrats on the book, 10 Rules for Resilience. Joe's pretty easy to find online. Sign up for a Spartan race, get involved, get active, and don't wait and sit around until you have everything figured out and all the answers, all the, all the answers to your questions resolved, you have to just begin. So the best pair of running shoes is the one that's already in your closet. The best bike is the one collecting dust in the corner and just get out there and start and go on an adventure with it. I, I wanna leave one more thought mm. on that. Um, I was in Florida, I told you when they did that test, that lactate mm. threshold test two days yeah. ago. I had these jeans on. I'm sorry if I smell yeah. a little bit. I had these boots on. I was not prepared, <laughs> but I that's the way I operate. Yeah. Right. Like why well, if I don't have the gear, it doesn't matter. So so um no excuses. Get out there and do it and be the hero. Right on. See you guys. All right, man. Come back and talk to me again. Every year. Peace. <laughs> <laughs>